Welcome to MSD at Home as part of the Melbourne Design Week 2021. Tonight we present a panel discussion in our series Politics and Utopia in Architecture. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the ancient lands on which we all virtually gather for this panel. The Boron Cherry, the Boy Burung, the Bunurong, Bun Burung people of the Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. We acknowledge that the land, sea and sky were never ceded and pay our deepest respect to their elders, past, present and future. With our series, Politics and Utopia, we argue that architectural practice and thinking is and always has been fundamentally political. We suggest that architects, while dealing with the many contemporary crises, hold the chance and responsibility to propose and work on a better future for all, hence the utopia in the title. As part of our series of panels, we are hosting tonight the presentations and discussions around the topic of indigenous knowledge systems. My name is Associate Professor Rojo Sintel, and I'm co-convening tonight's panel together with my colleague, Dr. Peter Reisbeck. Thank you, Rokas. My name is Dr. Peter Reisbeck, and I'd also like to welcome you to tonight's panel. I think this is a discussion about Indigenous knowledge systems and their possibility to engender new theories and practices in architecture. We will hear from our guests what we as a society can learn from more than a, a more than 60,000 year old culture, its relationship to country and its voice, its law and its living embodiment outside of our colonised world. What can architects and indeed landscape architects learn from Indigenous knowledge systems? How can we deal with this difficult, unresolved an important part of Australian history and current politics. How might architects acknowledge the genocidal history of the past and the ecocide of the present? The rivers like the Darling River, the Barker are dying. What do we need to learn in general and specifically as architects? How can we listen better in order to support First Nations people in this country? How can we hear First Nations voices as the earth itself is crying out? Politics and Utopia and Architecture derives from explorations I have been undertaking in the pedagogical context of Studio 40, a graduate design studio here at the Melbourne School of Design. I find it important and necessary that we raise these questions in our architecture schools across the country and internationally. In Studio 40, we want to acknowledge the numerous challenges we face and develop creative and utopian proposals in response. These challenges also include the loss of biodiversity and the extinction of indigenous species, industrial food production, the shortage of water and our climate catastrophe. Students in Studio 40 engage with and try to learn from indigenous knowledge in order to create meaningful and holistic relationships to country. We question existing socio-political and, and environmental frameworks and ask how our worlds could be different. Proposals range from sanctuaries and nurseries for indigenous species to indigenous food production, from places for creative artistic expression to cultural exchange, education and learning. This virtual space we are sitting here tonight at tonight's panel discussion is part of a design proposal by Dylan Newell, a master's student in Studio 40, rewilding and creating sanctuaries for indigenous species. Jeff Greenaway convened in 2018 the inaugural symposium of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. This was entitled, Go Back to Where You Came From, Indigenous Design, Past, Present and Future. Jifa carefully curated the symposium as a provocation to explore the role of Indigenous design to showcase a range of established local and international First Nations design practitioners across a diversity of disciplines, 
and to create an opportunity to reveal design approaches which straddle interconnected themes of culture, country and identity. It is fitting that this is the first of the series in the series that we've set up, Politics and Utopia at the Melbourne School of Design. Some last comments on our role uh, as co-conveners before we start introducing the panel. We see these panel discussions as an opportunity to bring difficult topics into the discourse, raise awareness and build an ongoing engagement and discussion within the school within the profession and maybe even within our society. Peter and I are facilitators. We are here to learn from you, our guests, to learn from each other. We will be excited and admit our own struggles with engaging with complex and wicked environmental, sociological and political topics. We both do not claim to be experts. We use these discussions as a platform for exchange, activism and learning. We're pretty excited tonight to have such an illustrious guest list and panelists with us um, for this, which I should say is also for Melbourne Design Week. And first and foremostly, I welcome Professor Barbara Wojcicka from Paris. Barbara is a professional researcher at the National Scientific Research Centre and member of the Lab Laboratory of Social anthropology in France. She's an anthropologist who has specialised in Australian Indigenous issues, strategies of recognition and networks shared with other Indigenous peoples, including alternative collectives for social and environmental justice against ecocide. Notably, Barbara undertook fieldwork in Central Australia with Welpuri people from Large Amanu since 79 in the Kimberley with the Dugon and Yaru people and their neighbours in the 90s and later in 2014. And in Townsville, she has worked on social justice issues, including the death in custody inquest of Cameron Dumaji in 2004 and the committal hearing of people arrested for the riot that followed on from Palm Island. Barbara is the author of many books, including Desert Dreamers, but most notably her most recent book, Indigenising Anthropology with Guattari and Deleuze, published by Edinburgh University Press in 2020, which I have a copy of, is absolutely fantastic. Welcome, Barbara. Welcome, Barbara. It's my pleasure to introduce from the Melbourne School of Design, Dr. Hannah Robertson, lecturer in construction management at the University of Melbourne and an adjunct research fellow at Monash Sustainable Development Institute Center for Water Sensitive Cities. Hannah's research specializes in remote uh, area building and participatory design through the facilitation of traditional owner led research and immersive and transdisciplinary teaching. She has worked and is working on building and design projects in collaboration with Indigenous communities in Cape York and Arnhem Land. Her research has been recognized both nationally and internationally, including the University of Melbourne's John Grice Award just recently 2019 and the Chartered Institute of Building Research Award also in 2019. Welcome, Hannah. We're very pleased to have you here tonight. Christine and Leonard, Uncle Lenny are here with us tonight and they collaborate at RMIT in the context of some architecture design studios. Uncle Lenny Clark is a highly regarded Aboriginal elder and human rights advocate from the Western District of Victoria and a Gunchamara elder. He was the first Aboriginal advisor to the police commissioner in Australia and currently sits on the county and magistrates court as a Koori elder. He is the son of the internationally renowned late Indigenous elder, Uncle Banjo Clark. Welcome, Uncle Lenny. Christine um, is 
an architect and senior lecturer at RMIT University. Her research interests um, include Indigenous partnership and engagement, Australian architecture, culture and heritage. As a non-Indigenous architect living and designing on unceded land in Australia, Christine is passionate about working with Indigenous communities to build a future that celebrates the 60,000 plus years of Aboriginal knowledge and living culture within architecture and design. Christine is dedicated to bringing Australian architecture to the public ground through her ongoing contribution to media, publications and practice. She was a co-host of Triple R's weekly radio show, The Architects, from 2010 to 2015, and is a co-director of Upla with Tanya Davidge. Christine and um, myself recently co-authored a book with myself, uh, re recently co-authored a book, Robin Boyd Lake Works, which was published by Euro in 2020. And I know from my involvement with Christine how passionate she is about these issues. Welcome, Christine, and welcome again, Uncle Lenny. Thank you. So tonight, panellists uh, will each give a very brief presentation with Barbara being our keynote. She will start, and then we hope for a really lively discussion. Uh, Peter and I have prepared questions and are also eager to ask, but of course we would prefer and we very welcome any comments, questions, and interaction uh, the panellists have with each other so um, it's really great to have you all here. We're so, I'm really excited and Peter is as well. And it's the first of our Politics in Utopia um, panel series. And it's a very good one to start with. So welcome Barbara and I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Please forgive me for my accent. I'm here in Paris, French, Polish born. And sometimes my sentences might sound awkward, but I prefer not to read anything, but just to talk to you. First of all, I also acknowledge all Aboriginal people of Australia and other Indigenous people, Torres Strait Islander people. But most of all, I acknowledge the people who taught me for 42 years now, the Warby people in Central Australia. And you can see on this image, the art center from Lajamanu in the, on the northern edge of the desert Tanami, which is also painted by Warby artist Kitty Napananka, who is sitting in the background, smiling at the screen like we are doing now, because they are all watching old archives that I have been putting on a special software as a way to respect indigenous knowledge in the process of restitution and also allowing the people to reappropriate themselves with their memory for younger generations who were not there when I started when I was 23. And generally people love it, although they have to respect for some of the elders, the taboo on the images of dead that you deceased people that you all know. We are here in 1984 in the middle of the Tanamai Desert in a place called Yardurlu Yardurlu, the granites, where there is since then and more and more over the decades, many, many multinational companies who make holes and transform the landscape. And in 84, the Wopui people, uh, when they found out that this incredible sacred site of rocks, which embody possums and plums, their ancestors for some of the local groups there uh, were going to be destroyed for gold mining. They decided because they just got the new tool of a video camera to make a film for the mining company. And they sent, they made it in Warbury, they sent it to the mining company. This is 84 and they won. And since then this site is untouched. And I know that this is not the case, unfortunately, for many places, despite different legislation. Now we see here Paddy Patrick Jangala uh, who passed away to very much too young like like many young Aboriginal men, some women but mostly men who go too quickly and uh, so that was his first film. He was a teacher at the school at the time and uh, 
everybody knows among us, but maybe not the people who listen, that everywhere in Australia, dreaming stories explain all landscape features. Uh, what we people say, Tukurpa for dreaming, and Tukurmanu is the dream, but it's a much bigger notion of uh, space-time where we can, we, I say we, because the Wobi people say that everybody in the world should be able to communicate with their ancestors who are a mix of ancestors of humans, but also of everything which is alive, including all the minerals in the landscape, which are alive, or the stars. So all material features of landscape that we see on the land, on the planet Earth, but also in the sky, are living traces, kuruari, in Wobri, of totemic ancestors, animal, plant, rain, wind, stars, with whom each local group identifies as descendant, ritual custodian, and traditional owner. Now, as I said, despite all the legislation in states and across the continent, we, we know that many places are threatened in Australia at the moment, be it uh, by the Adani mine uh, in Queensland, uh, be it fracking in the Northern Territory or Western Australia. And I imagine there is also a lot of struggle in other states. Now, here we see um, a painting, I mean, the movement of the acrylic paintings, the dot paintings in Australia, which completely transformed the history of contemporary art across the world with the success it had among collectors of modern art and uh, in um, museums and galleries everywhere in the world. Now, this is a mapping, right? A mapping made traditionally by Warby people and their neighbors. And here we see the country that we saw as a photo before, the granites. So the south, North line that you see is, is uh, the, for the wallaby and uh, the seed women, acacia women, and the uh, east-west that you see lines, double line, is exactly crossing and arriving to the place that we saw as a photo before. And in the middle is Muliukarichi, the, the, the place, very sacred place for Barbara Gibson Nakamara, my Aubrey mother who passed away. And uh, long time ago, this is why I'm saying her name, Nakakut. And uh, she was very precious for me and translated, helped me to translate in the beginning before I could properly understand Walbury, how, how to give honor to the complexity, the philosophical complexity of Walbury concepts. Now, you see, she's doing a sand story in the sand and the uh, icons are the same as the one used with the acrylic paintings in, in general desert art. So circles for places and lines either straight or mandering for traveling, whoever is traveling. So what is very important here is that this is not representation. This is not symbolic. It's not metaphoric. It's literally a cartography which expresses the traces, the icons, like any tracks that hunting, gathering people are reading in the landscape. The land is a book. Now, this is an extract from a bilingual book by an architect called Francesco Carreri. He's Italian, but he also teaches in Paris. His book, Walks, Walkscapes, uh, has used um, a mapping I did, thanks to the Wobri people, of some of their song lines, some of those trails of their Tukurba dreaming ancestors. And there is a few dots that you can see uh, in here, but just uh, on the right part. And this is a mapping that we created with Wobri people for a digital uh, version in the 90s of an interactive version that allowed to travel uh, through 14 constellations of dreaming tracks, which were the paintings, the dreamings, which were the most painted by the people at the time. So this is, uh, doesn't mean that it represents, again, uh, it doesn't pretend to be uh, a, a, 
a holistic uh, total vision of uh, the Walbury land. It's just a selection of some of the trails which were the most, most important, not just uh, to paint and to dance and sing in rituals, but also politically to look after the land at the time. Now, the Wobi people were about 4,000, and in Lajemano there was 800 people living in the 80s, 90s, uh, a bit less now because a lot of people go back and forth in the cities. There is even people living uh, in the south. Maybe you met some in Melbourne or certainly in some occasions. Now, what I would like to say about that mapping is that uh, here in Carreri's book, the the there is mention of the Warby people and of from where this product which was constructed with the Warby comes from. But unfor unfortunately on the web, this, this map, which, was, which I published in an art catalog to, to uh, enhance Warby art and also art from Balgo, the Kukacha people and other Western Desert people, uh, is reproduced on Google without any notification and is even reproduced, and this is really important for students, by some younger architects who quote Carreri and as if it was just an Aboriginal dreaming map. Now, this is a problem. Of course, you can see that every dreaming track has a Warby name. So I actually found out about that when I was at the art center in Lajemanu and the walk we were looking for one of their dreaming to see uh, how to translate it and they found that map. So the Warby word arrived on the map, but the map did not say it was Warby. Now, housing. The house you see on, on the bottom is where I spent one year with the with five Wobri ladies, my sisters, the five Nungarai, I was called Nungarai in the Kichip system, uh, the skin names, as all the desert people say. And this house was empty, all broken, all walls were pulled down. And uh, I said, I'm happy to, to live there and share it with whoever wants to come. And then, a few months later, we fixed a, a few things, but we did not put any walls inside back. And when the housing commission came, they were invited to come and see what sort of housing the Warbury women wanted to be in a chili me, that is a woman's house. They didn't need special rooms. Uh, and this is how they wanted to sleep. And they didn't need the broken kitchen. They cooked outside. Now, at the time in the bush, I mean, these people still do it. There was those shelters you can see on the top. Here we are still in 84. So in 79, when I started, there was less houses, but all the houses here, mostly in the north, uh, I mean, it's actually not the north, but the west in Rio, all the houses on the background are, are occupied by, were occupied at the time only by white stuff. Or, and, the council, and some council members who were Warbury people. Uh, and most people were living in where this big camp is with little humpies and little camps, very well organized. And on the left, the little houses that you see, which were just a square one meter, were only used for shortage. And that was called the Inu camp. Now, you can see here the bushes, which are uh, the, the wind break and in the day the mattresses were rolled and in the, at night they were unrolled for sleeping. And this is how roughly 600 people lived still in the 80s. Now this is a zoom on the what, what we call the top camp and you see a structure of one family camp uh, where um, Iron, shed, uh, iron, um, with, um, iron. Sorry. Now, on this photo, you can see the a zoom on the top camp, and another zoom on a family camp with uh, iron shed 
used as beds on top of uh, flower drums. And then on behind the beds, which are lined up one next to the other, like when people sleep on the ground in lines, not in circles, there is a windbreak, not of bushes because there is not enough bushes all around, but again, iron, sh iron sheets. And then behind you can see other iron sheets, which are built up like a, like a tent. And this would be used when it rains or for storage. And also you can see a bow shed on four poles uh, with the bushes, which is used for, to shade from the sun. Now, in 2012, and right up to last time when I was there in 2017, these ladies who are world renowned artists since 20 years at least, lived in this camp inside the settlement. That is in the section which we saw on the map being the white section, but which expanded with uh, different uh, buildings. And uh, they had a house that you can see underneath, which was called the Chilimi, which had a big hall in the middle and rooms on, on the sides. And things changed in 2012, since the 80s, people like to have rooms that they can lock to put their stores because anybody can come in in a house and if they have nothing to eat they can take what they find if they are cold they will take the blankets so the middle part is where the women would sleep again if it was the rain but in 2017 this house was a disaster not there was leaks for, from rain. Um, there was a lot of dogs and so many people and young people would come and break everything. And they were asking to have a proper housing that is a house so they can rest inside against the rain, against the, the heat, the shade, just rest from all the things that are going on around them. And in 2017, they still did not have a proper chili me. And here you can see, by contrast, this dress in fashion, right, was made from a painting by Lorna Naburula Fencer in an agreement uh, with the designer uh, so this is another aspect for respecting indigenous knowledge, which is really important, is all those protocols to do things together so that the benefits go to the community. So for instance, the CD-ROM YAPA that we did with the community, we developed a special protocol so that uh, 50 artists who were involved in making the CD-ROM received 25% benefit from UNESCO on all the sales and they also put the conditions of distribution of the CD-ROM which had to be in museums or in universities where the knowledge was also contextualized. Now another contrast just like with the fashion here you see a humpy which is painted and it's a very precious object of art and it was um, exhibited in, uh, in a big exhibition in Germany. Wanta Jampi Jimpa, Steve Patrick, is uh, an incredible Warby man who was a teacher, now is a recognized uh, academic uh, through his uh, program that he had uh, with, the Institute of, with um, the Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies in Canberra. And uh, he really self-trained himself to be a mediator between uh, his culture, Warby culture, and all the pressures that exist in general conceptual Western life. And he designed in 205 an incredible uh, lesson uh, that he gave on YouTube in 205, uh, in the sand, where he explains the five pillars of Warby law, 
by saying that really these five pillars that should also be are probably pillars not just for other indigenous Australians but for all people around the world if we were living according to the values which are indigenous values which do not separate nature culture people and everything else now the five pillars he says in the video that some of you probably saw and that you should look at because it's a fantastic video so he says for dreaming not jukurpa the dream but kuruari the traces we talked about before language yirdi kinship and he says warlalcha which means us mob that is the people who are close to me uh, ritual and he says pulapa which is the public ritual and all sorts of names for all sorts of rituals we have one word to cover all sorts of rituals in english and home is muras this is why the clip is called murakurlu with mura and mura means several things it means home but it means also the camp and it means one day because when people were traveling uh, they would say, I spent so many camps, so many days at that spot. And so space and time at that level were also not separated. Now, I have a quote here. Uh, before I read the quote on the left, uh, Wanta Jampijimpa had this great idea to, to uh, respond to a lot of social problems that will be people faced and also other people really it also happens in france with our in some of our district with people who are discriminated now young people who destroy themselves in different way and when i say young it can be kids so he established a collaboration with a theater company trucks who is based in darwin and very regularly they did uh, shows that were presented in Darwin or and they started to uh, use hip-hop at the time because it was 20 years ago or more uh, in the school to make workshops to give back the sense of culture to the young kids and it gave the Milpiri festival which happens every two years I was there two years ago it was cancelled last year because of the pandemic and hopefully uh, I will be able to go to the one that is planned in September. And if you can go, because it's extraordinary um, commitment from the population where young people and old people try to reconstruct together what has been destroyed for very different reasons. Now you can see actually me dancing here on that photo next to my sister, Betty Nungaray. Now, you have a quote of a French uh, psychoanalyst who wrote with a famous also uh, philosopher uh, many books together or alone. And he, these two people, Félix Guattari and Gilles Deleuze, which are in the title of my last book, Indigenizing Anthropology with Guattari and are very often quoted by architects. Uh, there was a fantastic uh, uh, international gathering of people who used Deleuze and Guattari in their thinking in all different disciplines, but it was organized in Inst Istanbul in um, 2015, I think, um, uh, the, in, that is in Turkey, uh, by uh, an architect. And here Felix Guattari says, we cannot hope to recompose a humanly habitable land without reinventing economical and productive finalities, urban assemblages, social, cultural, artistic, and mental practices. Now, what Guattari is saying for the world in general, from the point of view of being a French, is actually what Aboriginal people in Australia, or all indigenous Australians, are doing this assemblage of all levels of relation to life. And in 1988, their strategy um, the, was for the Warbury on the right, 
of the painting that you see here with the Yongu from the Arnhem Land, the north, north of, of Australia, to paint a petition with five points. The first one was to ask a national elected organization of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders representatives. Now, two years after ATSIC was created, in 2006, it was dismantled, still no representative body. Second, they asked for the signature of the UN, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In 2008, Australia signs the UN the Declaration one year after all the other countries of UN, because there was a change of government, you would remember. But in 2017, when the UN Special Rapporteur came to Australia, met many Aboriginal organizations, she was very shocked by the situation. It was the time of the scandal of the kids which were very, very mistreated in jail, in Darwin and other issues. And she denounced the structural racism in Australia. The third point that the Barunga petition was asking was a treaty recognizing the first Australians. In 1993, the Mabo native title law invalidates the notion of terra nullius and allows some groups to claim their ancestral land at the condition of cultural continuity, which has created a lot of, lot of problems for many people in Australia and a lot of conflicts inside different Aboriginal communities. In 21, hundreds of claims are still in process, but native titles do not really allow people to self-manage their country and communities. The fourth and last request on that Barunga petition, which, was, which is hanging at the parliament today, I hope so, because I heard that Aboriginal flag was not allowed to, to be hanging at the parliament. Now, the fourth point was, uh, generally speaking, social justice. And, 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 a, and a just system of police. Now, in the 1990s, there was a Royal Commission into Death in Custody that put together some 40, 400 recommendations, which very few were adapted. One of them was to have video, um, videos in cells, but you probably know that uh, during the Palm Island uh, inquest, after the death violent deaths in custody of Cameron Dumaji, uh, it was shown that the video camera was not watched by the police and uh, it was not turned, the sound was not turned on. So um, these systems do not respond to human ways to deal with criminality and criminalization is another problem. So this case was a test case which uh, created all over the world a lot of hope to fight police violence. And uh, here in France at the moment, we have uh, a lot of pro problems uh, with these issues and the government pretends to say that it's an American problem, but it's a world problem and the solidarity between all the people across the world. And uh, this case with Lex Watton, who won in 2018 a class action against the intervention of the third police that arrested people who were asking for social justice for the deaths of Mulringi. And they won 32 million Australian dollars compensation and a public apology from the Queensland government. Oh, so that's... A step. Yes, so Indigenous people are present in many, many areas in Australia. This is an example, Brooke Andrew, curator of the last Biennale in Sydney. And of course, uh, Jeff Granaway that was mentioned in the beginning, and other people have designed the International Indigenous Design Charter that comments on all this. And it's very important to look at the work that has been done on housing and uh, and especially Paul Mehmet and others uh, in 203. Take two. Thank you very much, Barbara. You put the fingers right in there. Structural racism in uh, Australia is still an ongoing problem and we have to look at it and think about how we can improve those conditions. I'm happy to hand over now to Hannah as the next presenter. All right, so my, my talk today is called Building for Development, and it's about a community-led approach of how we can work together 
um, with uh, Indigenous communities and with other communities actually as well um, to co-create um, solutions together. Um, before I go on, I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, country and I acknowledge the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nations whose land I'm on today, but I also acknowledge the Okula people who are the co-creators and co-authors to all of the research that I'm going to talk about tonight. tonight. The research is conducted on their traditional lands um, and the emergent research contributions from this work would not have been possible without their generosity in sharing country, stories, culture, knowledge and friendship throughout these projects. But it's also really important to acknowledge that this is the combination of experiential knowledges from country, of um, traditional indigenous knowledges of country, contemporary understandings of country and how it's changing under context of climate change and other um, situations that are happening on country, as well as bringing together university knowledges that offer technical support um, in support of traditional owner needs and aspirations. So the founding principles, and I'm just going to talk about four key principles to that can be used to underpin community-led research approaches. One is contextual responsivity, so responding to the place and the specific environmental and situational context of that place. The second is participation, and that being at the core of a community-led approach and ensuring that participation happens across every stage of a project. The third is partnerships and acknowledging that in order to achieve a shared vision, um, there may be a number of different people that can come on and help support that, that vision, but that underpinning that it is driven by the needs and aspirations of the traditional owners. And the fourth is that there is ability to adapt and change as aspirations change, as uh, situations and challenges come up and how you evolve with them. Um, but that together these four principles are constantly interacting and coming in and out of a um, community-led research project and research approach. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of our Okula Cultural Knowledge Centre project, which is a partnership between the University of Melbourne, um, the Okula Aboriginal Corporation, the Centre for Appropriate Technology, and a number of other partners, including Arup Engineering, and a host of volunteers, a big team of them who are involved in working on this project. So to begin with contextual responsivity, the site and the location of our site for the project is a place called Sandy Creek Bore, which is on Olkala country. Um, Olkala got their land back in 2014, uh, which has been a real stimulation for Olkala to get back on country and create the livelihoods that enable them to live on country and look after country moving forward. So um, in 2018, in February, Olkala sat down and they articulated a vision for what their cultural research centre would be. And this was about responding to what was needed on Olkala country, as well as the participation of Olkala people in that process. In August of 2018, um, there was a partnership that emerged when I contacted the Centre for Appropriate Technology, who I'd worked with before, and Andre Grant from the Centre for Appropriate Technology in Cairns, and said, I'd really love to work with an Indigenous group that are interested in a catalyzing infrastructure on country that is about supporting multiple sustainable livelihoods. And Olkala had articulated this vision for their cultural knowledge centre. And so there was a coming together through that partnership. I think it's the best way to summarise the vision for this cultural knowledge centre is um, in Uncle Mike Ross, um, his words. And Uncle Mike Ross is the senior Olkala traditional owner and elder and the chairman of the Olkala Aboriginal Corporation. And he says, we want to use the centre for all projects, recording knowledge and we want to use the Centre for All Projects, recording knowledge and sharing information on our country and our culture. We want to use all our knowledge we can get on it of our landscape to manage country, putting together scientific information and cultural knowledge. We can do in a lot in a centre based on country because you're not talking about your country, 
your own country. And so the Cultural Knowledge Centre is a place for conducting cultural tourism research, for, um, sorry, cultural tourism, for conducting land management research, um, for uh, enabling scientific and traditional knowledge to come together and um, use the best of contemporary science with emergent and traditional Indigenous knowledge um, and to stimulate that on country, as well as a ranger base so that the rangers can actually stay on country and be near um, the Alwal sanctuary. Alwal is a rare golden shoulder parrot that is located on Okla country and the Alwal live in uh, termite mounds. And so this, the Awal Sanctuary is about 15 minutes down the road from our proposed site. So there are a number of different um, sustainable livelihood opportunities that come out of this cultural knowledge centre. Again, looking back to our key principles, the contextual responsivity that response to the site and participation are at the core in the beginning of how our partnership came together. The initial step um, was a, an initial site visit on country where we sat down at Sandy Creek Bore. This is us on site. And Uncle Mike Ross, who's pictured in this photo, sat and talked about what that vision was as he drew in the sand. And this vision is really what has sustained and underpinned this project. And this is two and a half years on from here. When we sat down at that initial meeting, the first step that was decided on was to create a master plan. And the master plan was going to talk about how these different buildings and how the infrastructure could support those aspirations to use the centre for all of the activities on Okla country. And as a way of doing that, we brought together a group of 16 students at the time from Monash University um, to help support that vision. Um, but, an, but adaptability came into the project because in December of that year, in 2018, there was the hottest heat wave uh, that Cape York had experienced in many years. Um, there were bushfires burning on Okla country. And so we had to redirect the trip to other country in surrounding um, Kukuyalanji country, which is a bit further south in Cape York. And we went and visited other self-built uh, structures. So the Cultural Knowledge Centre is going to be self-built by the Okla Rangers. Um, so we went to other self-built structures. This one is Bush Owner Builder Project, which was actually completed in partnership with Cape York Partnerships. And this is Doreen Hart, who's um, the traditional owner and uh, a, a head of the family who was involved in this project and self-built the house um, using sustainably milled timber. So these students came and visited other self-built um, houses across Cape York to understand how, what was involved in the process and how you could go about it. So we had to adapt in that process. We did managed to sit down and do what we had originally planned, which was to map this master plan using participatory design practices with Uncle Mike Ross and with the traditional owners. And on the final night, we managed to come back to Cairns and meet up with Uncle Mike, who after being caught in a flood, we, we managed to reconvene. And this master plan was drawn, was drawn. And again, participation and adaptability were key in this stage. From this stage then emerged the master plan. And you can see this is the drawing from Uncle Mike, um, which has essentially underpinned and continued to underpin the Cultural Knowledge Centre. The students then reinterpreted um, these uh, master plan schemes, along with that drawing was a two hour conversation and that was turned into four different master plan films. This was the film that was chosen by Olkala as being the scheme that they wanted to continue. And you can see the key kind of design elements that uh, were present in Uncle Mike's drawing are translated into this master plan and continue today. So in Uncle Mike's drawing, there was the snake, a snake path here, the Cultural Knowledge Centre on the south side, the Ranger Base on the north side. And again, we have these elements being into account here. We've got the um, snake path going around here, the Cultural Knowledge Centre on this side, and the Ranger, part, Ranger Base on this side. Celebrating the small wins as we go through each of the stages of a long-term project like this is really important for acknowledging the contributions that everybody's making to a co-created um, project. And for Melbourne Design Week two years ago, 
we had an exhibition at Monash University where five of the Okula Rangers came down and we showed um, the, the master plan films on the big screen at the campus green in Monash Caulfield. And this is really important to celebrate these steps. This also then propelled us into the next stage, which was to create a detailed design. And in this opportunity, we actually then took another group of students, actually half of those students were the same ones. They wanted to continue working with Olkala and Olkala wanted them to continue working um, with the same students. And so we went back up to country and spent two weeks in Cape York, sitting down and having a range of different design sessions. So um, that participation was really key throughout that process. So we went and sat down on country as well and remembering again that contextual responsivity was really important, understanding the role of country and how this would play and what this would play in the building and listening to the stories and how that informs the meanings and the way the building needs to respond to site. And again, participation being at that core. Coming back to Melbourne in June of that year, Zoom was not so much a frequent uh, interloper in our lives, but at that, at that time, it, it did enable us to then have design sessions with Olkala from afar. And this is something that has continued throughout the collaboration. Um, and so participation and adaptability to that distance has helped us and it helped our collaboration continue. We then sent the designs that the students produced from that semester up to Olkala for them to consider at their board meeting and then the Olkala traditional owners picked the schemes and the aspects of a number of schemes that they wanted incorporated into their design. So the, design, the, the designs were quite wide ranging. Some of them featured um, a lot of locally milled timber, um, elements of weaving and other um, cultural practices. Um, and then the design that was chosen is one that's made of rammed earth. So using Olkla country to build on Olkla country. And this is the design that we're going to be building this year. So the project's gone through a number of stages and in 2020, we submitted for town planning and were successful um, with the growing indigenous tourism Queensland fund, which will see us building a prototype, um, which will involve the kitchen toilets and showers and a large viewing deck area. And this will test the rammed earth and the locally milled timber systems that are involved and also provide the upskilling and training for the Olkala Rangers who are involved in the construction. Our, pro, our partnerships have expanded and the adaptability has come in again. And so we now have a number of other projects that have grown from this particular cultural knowledge center project. One is looking at um, sustainable livelihoods on country and using um, contemporary technologies such as micro desalination and drones um, to and VR and AR to understand and optimise the way that we can manage country and that Olkula can manage their country. And then the other project that has also emerged is one that's looking at that cultural archive repatriation, digitisation and um, also using contemporary technologies as well around um, VR and AR, as well as uh, technologies around rock art um, dating as well, to think about how we can display um, those Okola cultural archives in the Cultural Knowledge Centre. So this partnership is something that has adapted and grown and Arup have come on as a partner to help with the pro bono engineering sort of certification of the Cultural Centre as well. So a typical Tuesday morning um, in, in the project involves a number of different um, interdisciplinary former students coming together to work on the project and move it forward. But we also have regular meetings with Olkala and continue to, part to ensure participation is at the core of every stage of this project. So in terms of that shared vision, we want contextual responsivity that's responsive to place, to needs, to aspirations, participation that's inclusive, that understands people's intrinsic motivations, that ensures co-authorship, that celebrates the small wins, and then partnerships that acknowledge that we can't do everything on our own, but that we can 
partner and grow and do a lot more together and that we could try and keep things achievable in order to stage the project and achieve and celebrate those wins. Uh, thank you so much, Hannah. That was great. And I'm sure we've got plenty of questions for you at the end about those um, participatory processes and the notions of adaptability. And it's certainly my great honour again um, to um, turn it over to Uncle Lenny and Christine, who will talk about their collaborations at RMIT and also on country. Thank you, Uncle Lenny. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Peter. So, uh, and thank you for your wonderful introduction, Peter. That was great. So tonight, Uncle Lenny and I are going to be talking a little bit about the design studios we've been doing together with my colleague, Stasinos Mansis, who I also teach with at RMIT in the architecture program. So I've been teaching design studios for a number of years, but it would have been about three and a half years ago, we received an invitation from Uncle Lenny to go down and meet him and find out about some ideas he has for his beautiful 200 hectares of land in the Western District of Victoria. So uh, the relationship began with me and my colleague, Jock Gilbert, who's a landscape architecture here at RMIT, um, heading on the train and meeting Uncle Lenny at Warrnambool Station, who took us back to his very beautiful land and spending the afternoon with him to find out about what his ideas were for uh, enabling his community and providing future opportunities there. So I might hand it over to you, Lenny, um, just to talk a little bit about that vision and then we might go back and speak to the three design studios that um, we've been running together. Okay, well, the, the vision that I and my people had We've seen many of our people getting institutionalised, getting jailed, and that could mean right from uh, babyhood. Like we've got a lot of kids being taken away by the child protection and resulting out of that children being taken, we're finding now a lot of our young mothers are committing suicide. And uh, we've got so many of our people in jail. And because all of my life, and my family, we worked within the justice field on a voluntary basis. I decided with my people that we must do something about it. We have to find alternative methods to confinement. We can't have our people going through the revolving door all the time. And so we looked around our community and we, we found that our people have got so much to offer the Australian community. And so we, we wanted to put that, what we've got to offer the Australian community and also help our community, we wanted to put that on display. And because we, you know, you, you people who's dealing with the Aboriginal people, you find that they are very talented people in regards to music and dance and everything like that. And because we come from the Western District of Victoria, this is where a lot of the music is created. And so we thought, well, if we could have some facility that would showcase uh, our talents and also keep our people off the street, also use, use that facility as a training area to treat, teach our people alternative in lifestyles. Never mind the drugs, never mind the ice. And if we could just move on and have this great area to not only help the Australian Aboriginal people, but also the general Australian community. After all, we all live together. And uh, so I thought that if, if we could have this great facility where we could have all sorts of music being played, uh, the recording studios, many of our people are, come from here like Archie Roach, he's uh, my first cousin, his mother and my mother, were uh, sisters and uh, we've got a lot of talented people here and 
we looking to create an alternative to where our people are being institutionalised all the time. We just can't go on with this anymore. So I'll give it back to you, Christenda, what we propose. So accepting that invitation and co-designing a design studio with Uncle Lenny, we have run, this is, we're now running our third design studio with Bachelor of Architectural Design students at RMIT. And we've also had a few that involve some landscape architecture students. So um, I think one of the things that's really important about um, finding ways that we can recognise and celebrate the 60,000 plus years of Indigenous history and culture that is ongoing and living today is to form these really wonderful relationships um, that I've had the privilege of doing with Uncle Lenny. So it hasn't been about just coming in for 14 weeks and leaving and taking that knowledge. It's about an ongoing relationship. So this, this semester is the third time we're running it. And in the background, um, Lenny and Stas and I have been working on how we can actually turn this project into a real project. Um, and I'll just share with you some of some slides to give you an indication of how we run the studio. So here we see, this was my first uh, time spent with Uncle Lenny where we started to work out the brief and how we were going to work with the students. And really it began with a conversation about Uncle Lenny's vision and how as architecture students, um, they might be able to bring to life visually some of the beautiful ideas and cultures that are specific to Kraywaron country um, and think about what kind of facility might be wonderful on this piece of land um, and think about how we might be able to use those visual visualisations to share with sh shareholders in the future so that we can actually make this project happen. So the students begin in a usual studio setting and then we hold a three day field trip down at Uncle Lenny's and we are welcomed by Uncle Lenny and his nephew Brett Clark, who is a very well known musician comes and welcomes everyone with a beautiful smoking ceremony. Uh, here's Uncle Lenny at the cemetery there where we are spending some time with his late father, Uncle Banjo Clark and his late daughter, Shara Clark. And it's really about the students understanding the community, the history, the stories, so they can begin to build this knowledge into their architectural designs. So there's a lot of time yarning around the fire, cooking. It's all about just immersing yourself in this culture, on this country. And those conversations are really an important part of the students beginning to form that knowledge and thinking about how they might be able to draw on that knowledge. There's a lot of site work that's done that draws on aspects that they observe while they're on the trip. And there's also a lot of collaborative work um, and getting the students to work together and meeting other members of the community and really getting to understand that country up close. And then the students come back to the studio setting um, and they do start to develop their projects even further, bringing in that knowledge. Uncle Lenny then comes back, is invited back to our country here at RMIT, which is Bunwurong and Woiwurong country. And with his son, we start to present some of the ideas. So it's very much about an ongoing relationship, sharing the design ideas, feeding that back, keeping the conversation going. And Lenny, do you want to talk about what that experience was like for you the first time you came back here to the Design Hub? Experience from what? Going to 
RMIT. Or, yeah, and, and having the students down at your place and then coming back to oh, look, I, design. Yeah, one of the main things that we should all uh, try to uh, strive for, which I've heard from the other talkers, is, uh, is, is collaboration together. It's very, very important because we haven't got those skills. We haven't got architectural skills. So, so, so we, we support each other. The RMIT or your university and everybody. But there's a long way to go. There's been a lot of uh, uh, ideas put up by the students. Um, and when we hope to go ahead with it, if and when we get the money to do it, is to pick certain parts out that we can have from different students, what they, what they design, what they put together. And, um, yeah, I think it's really important that we all work together on it. As I said earlier on there, it's for all of us. And if we can all work together. And the, the relationships that have already been formed between the students and Lenny is really quite mind boggling because yeah, it's they, they are still in touch with me today. If they go back to say uh, America or Russia or wherever, they'll, they'll keep in touch. Uh, they still interact. And I think one of the main things like uh, after we finish all that whatever and get around the campfire, uh, we're not uh, shaming having a drink or having a feed or whatever. It just loosens everyone up. And uh, we all work together and they all become, we all become one and we all become mates. And uh, I like it the way they interact with the, uh, with the land and I get to tell the history of, uh, of Framlingham Aboriginal community of where I live and uh, the history that we had there. Like we was one of the first where white colonisation first took over was the southwest part of Victoria. And um, I know, of course, we felt the brunt of uh, white colonisation and our people, uh, there was a famous war that took place for 21 years straight where we held back the white colonisation of the rich Western District farmlands. And uh, the white people lived in absolute fear of our people. And, uh, but we were no match with the, um, with the musket, the poison water rolls, the, um, the, uh, the common flu. And, uh, and all this history, we want to incorporate it somehow into this great building that we intend to do, where it re reflect uh, the history of our, our people. And uh, so I'm constantly in touch. I may be leading it, but I'm constantly in touch with other people in the community. And uh, we've picked a site. I don't know how many acres or hectares it is, Christine, but we've picked a large area and that's near our cemetery. And a lot of the teachings that will be taught in this had come from my, my father. He was a highly respected Aboriginal elder. If you want to check him out, his name is Banjo Clark. There's a book written on him, sold it throughout the world. And he's, we want to incorporate his teachings, not only for our people, but also for, for uh, non-Aboriginal people in society. We want this thing to work for all Australians because we feel that we've got something to offer uh, non-Aboriginal people. Can I ask the two of you at that moment? Um, so like, you know, you, uh, Christine, you talked about co-design and, and Hannah talked about participation and you say you have a lot to offer. And um, we're discussing, you know, how we as architects or architectural um, universities uh, could support the course, and that's what Hannah also does in Old Collar Land, and, 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 to, and basically respond to your needs. My question, in a way, is also uh, maybe also to Christine, uh, Leonard, and, and Hannah. Um, beyond that, is there maybe also a way where we have to rethink how we think about architecture in terms of a much larger uh, conversation, which ties in with your, you know, different connection to country and respect of country and, and the talk Barbara gave about like this um, 
you know, being connected to everything around us and not exploiting it and having a, a, a relationship and they are all our ancestors. So is there something where we actually t- beyond going beyond helping or supporting or having a dialogue or co-designing that we actually start maybe rethinking even fundamentally how we produce and what our architecture would look like? Well, I think the first thing that I have learned is how important it is to understand where I'm situated and that I'm designing and living and working and breathing on unceded land. I live on the land of the Yalakut Willem people on Bunurong country. I teach on Bunurong and Woiwurrung land. And when I'm doing my design studios with Uncle Lenny, he has welcomed me onto his Krewurrung land. So I think understanding that relationship is the very beginning to um, becoming architects that can better celebrate that 60,000 plus years of knowledge and beginning to form those meaningful relationships is, is the step, first step. And I'd just like to share with you some work produced by some of our second year architecture students, Emma Croker and Kieran Merriman. Thank you, Christine, for sharing that presentation. You're welcome. And Lenny didn't mention this, but the the site where he, the Framling and Aboriginal um, mission is a very well known one, and it was the place where Uncle Archie Roach was stolen. And Lenny, do you want to tell the story about you and Uncle Banjo and how Archie Roach's very well known song came about? Oh. Yeah, uh, just very briefly, because I think we're running out of time, but Archie didn't get taken from Framlingham. And he, 
when he he was fostered out, and when he came back, he went to my father, Banjo Clark, and he, and the old fellow said to him, Archie, why don't you write a song about your history being taken away? He said, I'd like to, Uncle, but I was too young. I didn't know what happened. And so our guest, we sat down and we told him his history. He then went back to Melbourne. He penned a story from what we told him, from what the old man told him. And I, I was sitting there and out came that song, which is used throughout the world in indigenous places, such as in uh, North America and uh, Canada in particular, and took the children away. And that's where he says, uh, a long time ago at Framlingham. Now Fram Framlingham is, has got a, a hell of a lot of history, but we, we can't get that in today, tonight. Like I, for example, uh, a lot of people don't know it, but uh, I had a relationship with a white girl and she wasn't allowed at Framlingham and the police worried the hell out of us. Anyway, they broke up the family and years and years later, my sister rang me and she said, we found your boy. He was, he was in England and he got taken to England, fostered out there. And that dear old lady, she came and stayed with us twice. And I always say, it wasn't her fault. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't the mother's fault. We were victims of a system that existed in those days. And that's, that's framing briefly. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And so music is really important to the Western District of Victoria and well, for we, the, the program. So yeah. um, the program is really about thinking about how a, a world-class music concert centre, along with a cultural and education centre, might be able to provide, not only showcase Aboriginal talent and Aboriginal culture to the world, but also be able to provide opportunities for the local community through employment, through learning about culture, yeah. all of those sorts of everyday life skills. We so, understand that music is the language of all culture throughout the world. And if you can get all your message out to the world, maybe things might change for us, which will be better for all Australians. All right, I've got a couple of questions. Um, so I think it's been great. And I think what's really interesting that's come across from each uh, presenter is the richness of um, Indigenous culture in different places. I think um, Christine and Lenny talking about music. I think Barbara showed us some really amazing things. And so I think I was wondering, Hannah, um, with the work you're doing um, around Sandy Boar, it's it's how what kind of what is the culture there? What are the sorts of things they want to um, ex express there in terms of culture? Well, I think there's a number of things that they want to express. I mean, there's a the key sighting of the um, building at Sandy Creek Boar has been chosen because the site itself is actually quite a neutral site. So it's okay to build, there's not cultural overlays on that particular site that inhibit um, building from occurring there. But it's also about 15 minutes from the Peninsula Development Road, which is a road that's going up through Cape York that's going to be sealed, which will mean that a lot, there'll be, it'll completely change the level of access to Olkula country. And when that happens, Olkula wanna be able to control who can come on their country and how that will occur. And so surrounding that area, about 15 minutes from there is the Alwal Sanctuary. So um, the rangers, the Okla rangers have been working really closely on land management work around protecting Alwal's habitat and ensuring that the Alwal are able to continue um, their breeding and, and things like that in the termite mounds. But they've noticed that there's been migrations of those um, of the birds over the rec over recent years. So there's the, the land management aspect of the culture, which is really rich. And Olkla are doing some amazing work around identifying new species on their country. They had a bush blitz only two or three years ago where they identified eight new spider species in one 10 day visit. 
So in terms of the richness of the land, there is so much to learn. There are also rock art sites that are near there. Some of those are not appropriate for non-Indigenous and non alkala people to go to. And so part of the role of the Cultural Knowledge Centre is actually about controlling access to country on Alcala's terms as well. And so some of the stories, it's a bit about what's okay to share and what's not okay to share and for Alcala to tell their story around that as well. So um, I think in terms of the telling the Alcala culture, I would leave that to Alcala to tell that. Um, but there are a number of rich stories um, that will be shared and in particular around the land and the stories that are connected to the land. And there's six totem species that exist across across Alcala country um, and telling the stories of where those species exist and why and how that's come to be um, are some of the key things that Alcala have expressed that they would really like to share. So mm. each country <laughs> is different and Alcala have, have their own unique and very rich um, history. The only other thing to add as well is that they're located on the backbone along the Great Dividing Range and so all the waterways go to both sides of the Cape from Alcala country. So Alcala also feel that they have a responsibility to their neighbouring traditional owner groups. So it's also about bringing those groups in as well and sharing and the access to how people can find out more about the neighbouring traditional owner groups as well. So in a way, it's really land management is really, as we might call it, is central to the culture. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah. That's, that's incredible. And that does underscore the diversity between um, uh, what Barbara and us talked about and also what Benny's talked about. I think one question I've got for you, Barbara, just to move it along a bit is, and this is probably a question for all the panellists, is with Wellcree, how, how is climate change changing their country and, and how they deal with their country and even perhaps, I think, how they might deal with their um, dreaming? Well, it's difficult to speak in their name. I can only catch up things that uh, I, I um, feel from uh, a lot of um, distress, uh, you know, what Gled Albrecht uh, has called the solastalgia, the fact that the environment is changing and that only old people remember things that the young ones haven't seen. And uh, the soil has been very destroyed by, by already cattle uh, all across the country. There has been extinction for many, many years before issues of climate change of different species before, because of the intensive management of land by colonizers, settlers and, and others. And so uh, there has always been an awareness from the, from the elders to denounce that. But the big question was with the beginning of mining, which in fact crisscrossed with, uh, with uh, climate change has aggravated the access to, to water. Now, we are in a desert country, which in fact is, has a very rich um, system of underground waters, which are all connected through a huge area, which goes for hundreds of kilometers. And uh, this, when there are drilling holes for mining, the elders used to say in the 80s, be very careful because if you, if you spoil and pollute one, it can affect the connections with the others. And this is actually what has been happening. And now with the acceleration for, for big projects of fracking, um, there is also uranium that have been found in the, the Tanamai Desert. It's interesting because before younger people would say, oh, this allows that, us to self-manage our country to get the money from mining because by getting the land back, we can, we can be our own deciders and this, that makes us autonomous economically. And the old people, some old people, most old people are saying, be careful, we don't really need the money. They were even refusing the welfare money at the time. And now 
there has been conflict be between families with younger ones who say, no, stop. No more mining for uranium, no more mining for fracking. So, and there has also been range uh, programs to uh, re to bring when it's possible some species that were extinct. For instance, mala, that is a, that is a little wallaby, very small, small one that goes right, right down to Ayers Rock. And there has been very successful programs for that. But for this, what, what is needed is to respect water because water is alive. Um. Just to add on to that, there's, I guess, a, Olkula's experience of um, mining is possibly relevant to this conversation as well. Um, Olkula have resisted lithium mining on their country um, for the same reasons um, that Barbara's expressed around not wanting to damage the land any further. There had been some mining, there had been cattle grazing um, on the country. Uh, but the lithium mining would have been very destructive to um, Olkala country. So the Olkala traditional owners collectively have resisted that from happening on their country. Um, but there are also opportunities that come with the carbon economy as well. And so things like payment for ecosystem services, and this is obviously determined by different traditional owners as to whether this is something that they would like to pursue on their country. Um, but Okla run a very successful carbon abatement program, which is essentially using traditional fire management techniques to harness carbon. Um, and by burning at the right time of the year, it reduces the amount of carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere. And they get carbon credits from that, which has given them a lot of autonomy and the ability to um, self-determine and invest some of their own money in their own needs and uh, aspirations and their priorities. So there are a number of different pay payment for ecosystem services opportunities that can exist on country across Australia. And there are a number of really wonderful examples of groups like Olkala who are doing that sort of work. So just to kind of counter, I suppose, some of the negative aspects around climate change, there are some really positive things happening as well. If I may add, in 2015, there was a delegation of uh, Indigenous people from the Kimberley Northwest Australia to present uh, the the fires ranger pro program exactly relating to what you're saying, and they were the only indigenous delegation that was invited during the COP21 to speak in front of uh, all the um, governments of the world. But then they there was uh, some 180 other indigenous representatives and especially from Brazil and South America, and they organized a, a meeting for the Alliance of the Custodians of the Earth. And there, most of the South American people explain that the carbon economy uh, is not so simple, that it should be encouraged to protect the forest, but it's a problem uh, when it's the mining companies who pay for it. Now, it's a United Nations program, but they insisted on a declaration that at the time the Australian delegation signed from the Kimberley. There were young um, uh, yeah, yeah, Yaru people and Medina people and Bunaba people, I think. And uh, that this program can only work if it is the different local bodies, regional bodies that, that fund it and decide, decide the local management. This is very important in many other countries, but I think it could be relevant for Australia too, rather than the companies who fund it, like in the Kimberley Shell Company, because this is what's called uh, the greenwashing. That means that uh, the carbon is giving income to Aboriginal people and improves the climate, but it allows them to destroy other land in Africa or Asia. We've got a comment coming in from um, Professor Ellen Frischow, Professor in Architecture and Philosophy. Uh, she's got a um, comment. One of the main lessons that seems to run across all the generous stories we have heard tonight is the value of slowing down, taking our time, not rushing, not expecting neat outcomes, but establishing relationships that unfold over time. Can we learn from this different approach to temporality? Is that a question? 
think just to make the point that that's absolutely true, and I think academics can often fall into the trap of um, seeking out grant opportunities, and often what that leads to is a, um, a filtering of your research to a particular grant that's out there, and you need to just push all of that thinking aside and um, learn and trust that your research will come very slowly if you form a relationship and allow that to grow organically and not get bogged down in academic timeframes, in business timeframes, and many beautiful things will happen. I mean, that's what both of you, Hannah um, and Christine and Lena, talked about this kind of, you know, allowance of building relationships. And it's also a discussion which in the past was, uh, you know, participatory design and co-design. You can't just come into community and take your project and then leave again. There's an expectation you create and you have to commit to them. So it's a oh, long-term well, relationship you're building, isn't it? Because you can't even take your project there. You have to start with no project. Yes. You have to so, go to... You have to, you have to allow the project to come to you via our indigenous elders and communities, and allow them and listen to them, um, and hear what their own visions are, rather than the traditional academic mode, which is okay. We're going to have a, we've got a project, we've got a problem we want to solve, and you know, architects are, are great at doing that, trying to think about how we can solve problems, and it's, it's not about that. It's about turning it upside down and yeah. listening. It yeah, does make I, me sorry. Sorry, Peter. I just it's agree right. with listening as being the key, the key foundation um, there. Mm -hmm. And but one thing I would emphasize is that there are some structures that exist within academia that can support this approach. Um, and the ethics approach is one of them. And having an ethics agreement where you clearly stipulate how co-authorship will happen, how those protections will be, be in place, how as your partnership evolves over time, there may be some opportunities for, or there, may, there, there needs to be opportunities to review whether this is something that still aligns with the needs and aspirations of the traditional owners you're working with moving forward um, so that the, the, the community group can opt in and continue to opt in to being part of that process and part of that partnership because it's a two-way um, collaboration and it really needs to be um, set on those foundations to ensure that um, the cultural information that's being shared so generously isn't being misused or misappropriated um, in any way. So just to How add did your relationship with the Alcola start? What was the starting point? The, the starting point was through a conversation with Andre Grant from the Centre for Appropriate Technology, and then um, spoke to Deb, who's the CEO of um, the Olkula Aboriginal Corporation and Olkula woman herself. And from that conversation, they were familiar with um, the Bushona Builder Project, which was a for another project that I'd been involved with. And they said, we need you to come out on country and we'll sit down. And so the first part was sitting down on country for several hours and listening to what that vision was. And a bit like, as Christine said, it sounds very familiar what you and Lenny did um, around um, sitting down and hearing what the, the vision is for country um, and also nutting out how a partnership might go for the first step. And the first step was the master plan with the students. And then also bringing in the ethics and making ensure for, right from the word go that this was a research project right from the beginning to ensure that Olkula's um, shared knowledge was being protected in that relationship. It does make me think that the problem with architecture school is we are bound by these semesters and maybe really if we were going to be serious about this kind of engagement we would start to say look you know our design studios maybe they should take a different structure a different timing and happen over a period of years and I think it's um, interesting, Barbara, because um, as an anthropologist, um, your work goes back many, 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 many years. It, it, it is almost a different time frame, isn't it, from the time that you did your 
um, PhD looking at topological issues to, you know, now. I mean, do you want to sort of say a little thing about that for us architects who are not anthropologists about those different, maybe different time frames? <clears throat> I think it's a really big issue, transmission. And uh, I, I very much appreciated uh, uh, Uncle, if I can call you Uncle Lenny, mm -hmm. yep, <laughs> what you were saying, especially because I was very lucky to meet Archie Roach twice in France, and where he's very successful. And uh, experience, I mean, experiences cannot be compared, but uh, there have been children taken away from French colonies to work in the Hexagon on the continent, like from the Reunion. And uh, there has been a movement that was partly encouraged by the success of the Stolen Generation movement in Australia. Because, and all these things that are made locally, they help other people who have similar problems. So um, that, that's one thing. But uh, the transmission is, of course, a big, big issue among indigenous cultures because most things were not written, but were performed orally and visually. And it is the, it is the link with the, the surroundings and all the living things around that maintain not something that was repeated, but was reactivated at every generation. So by breaking people from their environments, there are things that could not be transmitted. But what I found extremely moving every time an Aboriginal delegation comes to France, especially three times at uh, the festival of shamanism for medicine men and different healers, is that Everybody who came from the Kimberley, from Queensland, from, from uh, no Northern Territory, they say to the people who come, the French people who come and who asking them for this, for this knowledge that they think they have lost because of Christianity and urbanization and everything. The, all the delegations, and there has been about, I don't know, 20 people who came already, say, but you still have it, just look for it in your dreams. And uh, they, they say, that, and uh, wherever you are, you can feel what is it, you should be able to feel what is in that country. If you have been displaced, well, you might be able to also feel new links with that country. We, some of them were saying, we have been displaced. And it's true that in many, among many indigenous people, for instance, in Broome, who, who, who who were not allowed to speak their language and so on. It is through dreams that things come up again. Even my, uh, my ex-husband, the father of our two beautiful daughters, Wayne Barker, who is a Jugun and Jabba Jabba man, when he came to live in France, he started to dream songs in Jugun. Mm -hmm. And so he, he did not really learn French, but all this, the, the situation of being in a different environment built up something. And I have many stories like that, but I don't want to take the time. Beautiful. That's um, all around us is our, is our culture and we're in harmony with that culture all the time. And that's, that's beautiful what you said, Barbara. And that's really depicts what, uh, what we on about down here. Now, when I said before that white colonisation took over here, they took our language, they took most of our culture, but we're trying to get it back and hopefully through this engagement, we could uh, build on our culture again. We're trying to get our language back again. And, and as you're saying there, you'll always find us, we're always in harmony, we always sit, in, it's hard to sit still because we're tapping our feet to nothing in particular, but we, we believe we're in harmony with, with the environment. Yes. How do we build that trust, Leonard, Uncle Leonard? Isn't that, isn't, I mean, isn't that big trust you're putting into the collaboration with Christine, for example? Yes. So, 
I mean, from hearing the stories, it's like, you know, is that is that something you invest in or you, you struggle with or Christine or the students? It's like this kind of, you know, this kind of relationship between um, with, with very recent history, which was devastating. So, I mean, I just can't even imagine where to start. Uh, look, uh, for some reason, our, our community and family, we've always ac accepted um, anyone into our family, into our community. We have that absolute trust. That's in our nature. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you go, if you go on YouTube and you see old Banjo there, and there's a video on him where he accepted people from all around the world. And that's, that's, that's reflected back. That's, that's us. That's how we are. In other words, Christine is like a daughter to me. And she's, she's come back home to us. But she's come back with a gift to help us. And so that's all I can say, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. To add to that, I mean, the first time I went to meet Uncle Lenny and he welcomed us with open arms and he also said, you will always be welcome back here. And I think it's just up to, and he says that to all of the students. He Each student was handed a book which was about Uncle Banjo Clark, his late father, and Uncle Lenny gave his phone number to every single student. And I think it's up to each individual whether or not they want to take that invitation up. And as Lenny explained earlier, there are students that still are in contact, that go and visit him, that email him from Peru and from Berlin and all over the world. And just back to your point, Peter, about how do we deal with the semester time frame issue, I think that's one way of getting around it is um, to keep those relationships going outside of the academic framework. And we offer um, every year, we run a, what we call an um, immersion, Indigenous immersion trip. So, and it's for any student can come. There's no assessment attached to it. It's just a, a, a chance for students to go out and meet communities that we've already been working with. So last year, we went down to Uncle Lenny's. We met Uncle Maud Alberts at Butch Bim. The year before, we went um, across to Barkindji country um, and my colleague Jock works very closely with them. So it's about keeping those relationships live and healthy in lots of different ways outside of your usual academic teaching frameworks and not letting that get in the way. One thing I think that, <clears throat> that we should be aware of is the fact that, uh, especially in the Western District or in Victoria, is the, uh, there's, a, there's a hell of a lot of Aboriginal politics. And I, I reckon it would happen all around Australia. So you have your, you have your different groups which could, could hold your, your project up. And we, we're always watching for that. And you, you follow that work in the Aboriginal community, you will probably find that. There's always uh, dissension in some way. We, we're, not, we're not all together within the Aboriginal community. That is a well-known fact, especially in yeah. Victoria. And uh, we get hamstrung a lot, a lot because, of, uh, because of Aboriginal politics. And uh, I suppose it starts from... Uh, from uh, white colonisation in the first place and it's still carry over. Barbara. Yeah, because uh, it's, it's really a great opportunity uh, to be all together on those subjects which are very important for all of us. This is not for the public debate. May no. I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I happened to be in Broome when there was a project of the Culture Centre. It's for you, Anna, especially. and and uh, Uncle Lenny, and it involved an incredible work all across the Dampier Peninsula of uh, meetings, interviews, and so on. This was at the time where they were, they were also fighting with the Ruby Bee to get their land back and so on. It was really caring and fantastic enthusiasm exchange between old people, young people. And uh, in the end, it, it didn't happen. But, uh, the process, I think, was as important as the building. Yes. Right? 
And uh, so I think this, for, for conflicts that happen in different places, the fact that it's the process is happening, whatever, even the philosopher Guattari and Deleuze talk about dissensus as opposed to consensus. And uh, dissensus brings life. And uh, I think uh, from old stories that I heard in different parts of Australia, when there is sometimes a conflict, it's a way of affirming that the culture is alive. Now, sometimes it's very difficult to live but uh, I, I also, I forgot the name now, but in, in Victoria, there is a fantastic culture center in the Grampians, which Rambach. was designed. Grambach. Grambach, yeah. yeah. Wow. I, I, this was fantastic and to me. Now, I don't know uh, what, what, how is it presented in the history of uh, architecture and culture centers? I would like to know from you who know. Uh, I didn't have much to do with the, my father did, and my brother, and it was set up by Parks Victoria, the state government, and they said, well, look, there's five Aboriginal organisations within that region that should have a say over it. And um, that was Horsham, Hamilton, uh, Portland, Hayward, uh, Framingham Trust, and Wannable, I think. But this is the Aboriginal politics. One Aboriginal organisation ended up running it mm. because of the politics. Okay. And nothing was said. I think it's so good to have that also flagged, uh, maybe with Barbara's comment that this sense is also a way of being productive and uh, you know being alive, and that's part of life. That's part of any any political engagement and any personal relationship. We're not always all in harmony and. Um, we have to work through our struggles, and that's part of our production of coming together. I'm aware bit, of... Um, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to a note to Barbara. I um, went and took my children to Brambuck a few years ago, and um, it's actually where I met one of Uncle Lenny's foster sons. And um, I asked them about the architect, who um, is quite a well-known architect, Greg Burgess, and their relationship with him and it's just on the, the point of relationships they said well he comes out almost every year that was built years ago so um, there was something to be said about that as a good example of a, a relationship um, that goes well beyond the, the life of a building mm -hmm. And at the moment, um, I think in a way, one of the custodians of um, Greg Burgess's archive, because he's at the point of or has retired, and there's some very significant um, Indigenous architectural projects in it. So one of the issues that we have is how do we then deal with the, um, the knowledge that is inherent, inherent to those projects as we try and preserve the work of this particular archive um, going forward. Brambrook is one of them, so um, it's, it's quite interesting. Yes, it certainly was a breaking ground in, uh, in uh, designing that. I think it, well, it won a national award, didn't it? Yes, and I think at the time there was a lot of um, criticism from some architectural yeah. critics who said it was kind of I think the horrible word that was used, which, you know, arguably a racist word, is it was primitive. Whereas in actual fact, when you look at it now and the participatory design and the ideas in it, it's actually really relevant. It certainly is. Uh, it's um, and the most interesting and most precious and possibly most complex topic um, we've been discussing. And I think, um, as you said, in a way, we, we will not offer an, an answer or a solution, but we want to encourage to continue the conversation and start an exchange and start listening and start engaging with each other and learning from each other. And um, I think um, 
Peter, are we coming to an end? Because I'm aware of the time, it's a quarter past nine here. Yes, I, th I think we're coming to an end. Um, so I think it's been an absolutely fascinating um, conversation. I think there's a couple of things I'll take away from it. And I mean, really memorable conversation. Um, I think Barbara's comment that transmission between cultures or through these processes does take time. But I think the other great thing was um, the quote that, you know, you still have these connections to country and we need to look for those in our dreams. I think, in fact, all of our dreams and um, when we go into country, we can still try and feel that as well. Um, and I think that's a really important thing for architects to begin to grapple with. So thank you so much. Rockus, you have worked tirelessly on this. I know that. It's been absolutely fantastic. Your studio, which I got interested in, I thought was great for tackling these issues. Um, it is part of Melbourne Design Week, so we're hoping this will be very popular. And um, I think we'll certainly thank Philippa Nack, Jet Baker and James Rafferty. And I think that's all for helping us um, tonight in the production of the panel. And um, so I'd like to thank you all for tonight's discussion. And Barbara, I hope, hope to see you in Paris one day if we can actually ever get out of town. And Uncle Lenny, I'm hoping I can actually see you on um, country near um, Framingham at some point. So I really you from me. Yeah, thank you so I much. I hope this could all come down. Yeah. And one thing that I've noticed, uh, what the uh, four of us talking, is that exactly the same from right up northern Australia, right down to, to Victoria, what we, you know, what we want to do. And, um, and I was, I was, I was delighted to be involved. No, I can be involved, and I think leave the politics out of it. Don't want to destroy it. And uh, also, people, if you can get my number, keep in touch. Thank you, Anne Lennart. Thank you, everyone. We're coming to yeah. panel discussion. Uh, we're just going to announce the next two panels. It's knowing the Anthropocene. A discussion of the future of architecture with the editors of Feral Atlas, The More Than Human Anthropocene, published by Stanford University Press in 2020. How has architecture to respond and adapt to the Anthropocene? We will hear field stories that demonstrate how we might care for a damaged planet. The panel includes two anthropologists. Again, the amazing Feral Atlas editors, Anna Lobenhaupt Tsing from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and also Aarhus University in Denmark, and Alda Kellerman Saxena from the Northern Arizona University. We also have uh, Dr. Len Frischow, Professor of Architecture and Philosophy here at MSD, and Charity Edwards from Monash University Department of Architecture and co-founder of the Afterlives of Cities Research Collective. The day after, on Thursday, the 1st of April, also at seven o'clock, they're all at seven o'clock as this one, we have politics and utopian architecture, shaping future societies, a discussion around utopian architecture, utopian societies, historical examples and socio-political experiments. Do architecture and architects have the potential to enhance necessary future societal changes? which I hope connects very strongly to the panel we had tonight. Could we address our current crisis from climate collapse or climate catastrophe and the loss of biodiversity to social injustice? Does architecture have an utopian agency? We have Dr. Felicity Scott, Professor of Architecture from the Graduate School of Architecture and Planning and Preservation, Columbia University in New York. We also have Dr. Lee Stickles, Associate Professor in Architecture at the University of Sydney, and Dr. Jonathan Lovell, an architectural historian whose research explores architecture's potential as a medium of communication. Looking forward to seeing you all there, and I thank again all people on the panel. It was an amazing evening. There's so much we can learn, and we hope we started a conversation. It's not the end of the conversation. Thank you once all again, and good night. Thank you.